unusual one in that because this is the board's reorganization meeting, um, typically the superintendent leads until uh, we get to the point where they elect a chair for the year. Um, so I will call the meeting to order. It is uh, 6.31 p.m. And then in terms of today, and the work that will be engaged in tonight. Let me pull up my notes. Big thing is that, um, right, it's about reorganization. Um, the board is going to determine who the chair, the vice chair, the clerk will be uh, for the remainder of this year. Um, we will welcome our new board member, um, Chelsea Sprague. Um, you also are going to hear from the elementary administration um, on student progress and from the high school administration on the status of their standards-based report cards. In terms of community engagement, uh, the board is open to hearing comments from the community. If there are folks that would like to speak, um, I think it's probably easiest if uh, you raise your hand um, so that I can actually see that in the in the listing of people that I have in front of me. Um, and typically when you're called upon, it's important to state your name, um, the town that you're from. And then we generally try to keep comments to about three minutes. Um, so do I have anyone for comments uh, to the board? Seeing none, we will move on. Um, and we are going to have a presentation from our elementary principals. I see we've got Erica and Pat. I believe David's here too, but I don't think I can see him on the screen. Um, to talk a little bit about uh, how the students are doing um, in terms of ELA, in terms of math. Um, it may be a little bit of a comparison between how their students that are in remote session are doing to the students that are in full in-person and the students that were in hybrid. So I'll leave it up to uh, Erica, Pat, and David to take it away. Thank you. David is going to present our presentation for you, and we will each take time to share some of those slides with you. Thanks for your patience. So I, I know most of you, but those of you that don't know me, I'm Erica McLaughlin, principal at Randolph Elementary School. This is my 16th year. It is my honor and privilege really to be working in this district and for all of you and for our community. Um, it's been it's awesome working here so long because you can, you can really get to know the families and the children as well as the staff. Um, and it's really, um, it's nice to have that historical perspective um, and see where we've been today. I can't imagine having done this work in a pandemic in any other place without the people that I work with. Um, so I just want to acknowledge all of them. And then hopefully David <laughs> can introduce himself or Pat and then pull up the presentation. Hi, I'm Pat Miller. For those of you who don't know me, and I'm the principal in Braintree. And, and uh, I don't know, I've been in the district a very long time, first as a teacher and then as a principal. <laughs> Click David signed on. Yeah, I saw him come in. You didn't hear it. Hmm. My guess is Pat, David. Can you present? Yeah, I'm just going to interrupt. I, this is Chris Armstrong. I can see David, so I know he's in the meeting. I can actually see him. I don't know if he can hear us or not. David, can you nod if you can hear us? He said he couldn't hear me, Chris. He just texted. Yeah, it looks like he can't hear any of us because he's not nodding. I'm just letting you know that I did see him. I still can see him. <laughs> That's good. Thanks, Chris. Are you able Pat, to you share yours, Erica, or no? My power is not super high. 
<laughs> I just said the same thing to my husband. I'm like, turn all the Wi-Fi off everywhere else. <laughs> Everyone, I'm mostly seeing lettered tiles. I'm not even really seeing that many faces right now. I don't know why. I always have good internet. Oh, here, oh, here we go. Oh, here David we go. is presenting. Perfect. Perfect. There we go. Awesome. So the slide you have in front of you, um, others in the on the board may have remember this um, from before. And because we have a new board member, I thought important to go back and just let you know that um, the OSSD has had an assessment plan and a schedule in place for years now. And as you can see in this slide, we have a variety of ass assessments in place that uh, we utilize um, throughout the year so we can monitor student progress. I'm hearing other schools have really relied on the SBACs, if that's the federal state-mandated assessment that we have. Um, and those schools will be at a, in a really in a hardship because they don't have SBAC data from last year or likely really solid data from this year. Um, so we are fortunate that we have done the work to have an assessment calendar and a schedule where we can take a, a look at our students and um, the progress that they're making. So any good assessment plan and schedule will have a mix of assessments from, you know, the normed reference assessments, the local assessments, state federal assessments, and that's what we have here. Um, so Erica, I he, can't hear, he can't hear us, so I'll text him when you want to change slides. I'll have to text him and just say next. <laughs> Okay. okay, go ahead. You can text them. So the assessment that we're going to share with you today is the Track My Progress assessment. Um, that is um, an assessment that we give throughout the year. And when we set the benchmark for that assessment, we aligned it to the SBAC, which is that state assessment that we have to give each year. And the reason for that is because we give this Track My Progress assessment throughout the year, it gives us kind of a predictor of how our students might do on the SBAC. Um, we started this using this assessment in 2018-19 and we've used it ever since. So using it for four years. Um, it's important to note that this year has been a more difficult time using this assessment as any assessment would be. Um, just because we have students in the remote sessions also taking the SBAC, and we do know that there have been some, some families that have assisted their students in this assessment from home, and others not. And in the students that take this assessment uh, at school, some of them have um, been in quarantine, and so there are some students that were missing uh, this administration. So it's not as pure as we have had in the past. Okay, next slide, and Pat will take it from here. Yeah, um, our district goal is usually that we aim for 70% of our students to be proficient in math and ELA, so that's the target. This graph shows our math with just one assessment on Track My Progress, which we call TMP. Data for all three elementary schools, we do our data all together for the three schools. This data shows our students across our three schools have had a decrease in proficiency by about 10% from last winter. However, our students' scaled scores in all grade levels have continued to improve. Currently, about 47% of our students are proficient or greater. Okay. Um, how many students did you say were proficient or greater? 47%. 47%. And you're shooting for 70. 70. Okay. Okay, we need the next slide. There we go. So this graph shows our literacy track my progress, the same assessment data for the three elementary schools. It's just in um, literacy this time in grades one through six. The data shows our students across all three schools again, and it's a decrease in proficiency by 6%, a little bit less decrease. Uh, than in math. Um, however, the same thing, our scaled scores at all grade levels have continued to improve in literacy as well as in math. And currently 42% of our students are proficient or greater in reading. Now, I don't know if we're gonna be able to hear David.
we're checking on that now. <laughs> All right. If okay, not, wait, we can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. I do hear you. Yeah. So I'm talking on my phone and we're presenting on my computer. This is not <laughs> ideal. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so we wanted to be able to compare um, our students in, um, in our full remote classrooms with our hybrid students. And so we worked, uh, we had um, Crystal put this data together. The orange line are our remote students. And from fall this year, from fall of 2020 until this winter, 2021. And the blue line are our hybrid students, uh, those students who are now four days a week in school. And you can see that, that in math, on average, our um, remote students are doing just about as well as our hybrid students. We have to take it, I mean, with a small grain of salt because um, these, our hybrid students, we don't control the testing environment uh, as well as we do at school because they're home with their parents and, and parents um, are sometimes too helpful. But um, with what we have, uh, looking at this, uh, our, our hybrid, our full remote students are not doing badly, and uh, and again, on average, are doing uh, about as well as um, our hybrid students in um, reading. I mean, it's a similar situation, and while there's a small decrease in the number of students, both hybrid and uh, full remote, who are um, uh, are proficient, um, it, it's commensurate from fall to winter again. So um, sa same lack of te you know, uh, testing control problem, um, but we are, um, we're actually pleased with this work. How many remote kids do you have? Is that a huge, that's probably not a huge sample size either, I'm guessing. It, that's correct. It, it's not a huge sample size. Um, we can see the numbers here. So um, of our first, so 17, 34, 36. Yeah. So there, there are 36 who are represented here in the reading. And of course, we're um, missing, oh no, sorry, 48 total. The 30, there were 36 in the fall because there was no first grade score. There were no first grade scores. So 48 total, and we're with we six who didn't participate for a number of reasons. It's a really good question though, Ann, because sometimes one or two students, when you have that small group, can really skew the data quite a bit. And when we reviewed it with Crystal, that's exactly the case in some situations. So actually this is really good. And um, again, board, especially if there's questions during, this would be the time to ask as well. Um, one of the pieces is that, you know, there's been this decline a little bit this year after a couple of years of increases. So the question is, is how, how much of this is due to COVID and, and the new environment? There's lots of considerations, actually. And David, if you want to go to the next slide and I'll start the next okay. um, Thank you. points of discussion, yeah. really which um, I think is a nice segue actually, because all across the nation, you're hearing the rhetoric, rhetoric, our children are behind. And others would say, behind who? The whole world is in a, in, in a pandemic. And so um, really, what are we talking about? And I am fortunate to be the state representative of the National Association of Elementary School Principals for Vermont. And so I literally have the honor and privilege of talking with principals across our country. And all too often I'm hearing about schools that haven't been in person since March. Um, and when I, when I hear that, I feel grateful that while we were in hybrid for quite some time and now four full days, our students had in-person instruction, those highest need students even in the summer and then others uh, moving forward in the fall. And so when we look at that data, yes, I'm sure that there's pause for some concern but there should also be pause to hear that there is scaled score progress in all our, our grades. And uh, we are still 
having in-person instruction. And so when you, I only say this to add some more context to this discussion, um, that not only are we needing to consider our students' academic uh, growth, but also taking into consider their social emotional needs as well, um, because our children have endured a lot. And next slide, and then it's David. So, you know, even with students at home in hybrid or full remote mode, they've re they've had to overcome quite a large number of obstacles. So they they've learned how to deal with different modalities of learning, switching from one to another. They've learned how to utilize a variety of learning platforms, and sometimes, you know, we're we're a little bit ahead of the teachers in in, in cases. Um, they've learned how to learn synchronously, you know, while their whole, their families are at home, sometimes helping them and sometimes being less than helpful, especially with people who have a lot of siblings in the house. Um, they've learned to complete their own work while taking care of siblings. Uh, we have a lot of kids who, you know, uh, are questionable, questionable whether they're old enough to be taking care of each other, but they've managed to do it and families have done their best really to um, make it so that they could learn at home and, you know, they could get to work and everything. And, you know, all of that in spite of, you know, coming to school uh, with kids in school. And it's like, we don't, we, we have so many rules that we've never had to have before. You know, you don't have, don't, don't share, don't get too close and wear a mask all day. And yes, it's not fun, but it's better than trying to learn from home. You know, they've learned about problem solving and they've become, really much more global citizens. They've, they've been connected to the world in a much different way. You know, they've managed to say, I should do something instead of, oh, I want to do something. And that's hard for kids, our, our, especially our elementary kids. You know, they've learned what happens when a parent loses a job. They've learned what's happened when a parent is home trying to do their job with them. They're trying to do their schoolwork. And they've lived with the grief and fear of, of people being sick that they know and love. And um, it's been a tough year for everybody. And we think that on the whole, they've done really well. Yeah, I'd like to wrap up by just saying, I was honestly myself, uh, and I know Erica and David agree, was really surprised at the growth in all of the grades, given all that the children have experienced in the last year. There was a lot of challenges, as you know. The continued focus, as Eric mentioned, on social, emotional, mental health needs of children um, will be of particular importance, uh, especially as our full remote children um, begin to come back. And, and by the fall, we expect them all to be back um, as one, which we haven't had for the whole year. Um, many of our children and families have experienced one of the most stressful years that, that they'll ever experience in their lives. So we'll continue to work towards meeting all of the student needs and assisting families with the as many stressors that we can. Um, and our data has been consistent throughout this and we'll continue to monitor that for growth along with um, areas of deficits that we can uh, help in. I think that's it. So thank you very much. And I would open questions up first to uh, mm -hmm. board members, and then um, we'll open it up a little bit to community members. Yeah, I just wanted to thank all three of you for the presentation. It's really helpful to see kind of where the kids are at. Um, I do request, though, if you are able to send the presentation to us, it was just really hard to read the numbers in there, and I'd love to just be able to see that a little closer up. But thank you again. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no worries. Normally, when we're in person, Katya, we hand it all out. So, <laughs> should I should have that from last year. <laughs> yeah, we should have sent it to you earlier. Other board questions? I just have an, another sort of technical question, just to, so that I can better understand the material. So, when you say scaled score, because it sounds like. You said overall there was a de decrease, and yet there was an increase, a slight increase in the scaled score. So can you just clarify what that actually means? The percentage is the percentage is based on, a, on the norm. Um, 
of the of the assessment versus the scaled score is the individual student's measure. So as a student, you would get a scaled score, and then the teachers would then later take a look at the progress that you as an individual made as opposed to the normed percentage. So norm, norm is usually comparing the students to a large group of students in the same age group across the, the country. Right, um, average. The, yeah, the scaled, scaled score piece, and Erica has, has hit it right on the, the head, um, that's really useful for showing personal growth. You know, it's kind of like the raw score that you get on the the the, um, the testing, and you can compare it to the last raw score that you got and see see if things have gone up. So that, that number isn't adjusted by anything. Um, so it's a really good way of telling what the personal growth of individual children are. So to just to clarify, so when you say our, we've had a 10% decrease in math, that's comparing us to a national norm group. And then when you say our scaled scores, that's comparing the kids to, to themselves and that they've all improved. They've improved. Is, that, is that basic? Am I understanding things correctly? Yeah. So... David, you want to elaborate? Well, 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 well I, I think that the question is this, that, that we're aiming for 70% of our students to be at or above proficiency. And, and that number has slipped by 10%, right? That, that, that's the, that percent is the percent that went down. So, so instead of having, I, I forget the exact number, uh, it dropped 10%. Yeah, and I, one of the questions that might be good for Crystal is in terms of the norming. My belief is probably that that when they're comparing our students to the other students around the the country, that's the norm score from before COVID. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, and so you know you yeah. can kind of think of the raw score as hey you know out of 100 questions, I got I got 32 right this time. And then the next time I took it, I got 47 right, right? You see growth that way. Um, with the norming score, it's really kind of seeing what the, the average is and where you fall in in terms of that average of, of everybody in the same age group in similar circumstances. But my guess is, is that that norm, um, the norming was probably done for data that was pre-COVID. Um, yep. Any questions from um, community members that may be out there? All right. I, I want to thank David, Pat, and Erica um, for the presentation. And just just uh, same thing with our high school administrators that are, that are here that are going to present in a moment, just for the incredible work that was done this year. Um, it has been around the clock since last March. Um, and so you're looking at a very, very perky group who are probably very tired <laughs> um, after after the last year. But thankfully, there seems to be a pretty good light at the end of the tunnel. And the next year is going to be a much different year. Um, as we get ready to switch over to the high school, um, I think it's important to talk a little bit about the fact that the state is um, in the middle of setting up uh, what they are calling educational recovery teams, um, which we will be talking about at the cabinet meeting on Wednesday. Um, and that's the state is recognizing that because of COVID, because of hybrid and because of remote sessions, that kids have fallen behind where they normally would be. And so it is setting up structures and systems um, to get a connected with ways um, to get the kids caught up um, that have fallen behind because of COVID. So with that, Elijah, um, I think Katie's here too. And I think I saw Lisa as well, though I can't see in the screen. Um, so to talk a little bit about the standards-based report cards, which have been, been some pretty significant ongoing work for a while. Yeah, thanks, Elaine. Thanks for this opportunity. We've um, we've made a presentation like this for a few years in a row this time of year, and we're asked to come back and and do this again. Um, we weren't asked to present on specific student achievement data, but we're more than happy to come back and do that at any, at any time, like the elementary schools um, just did. So I think the way we're gonna work this, Lisa, you said you might present while I talked us through the slides and then during the Q&A portion of things, or even along the way, if you wanna stop us and ask questions, um, 
Those can be fielded by Katie or Lisa or me. Lisa is our head of lower grades and Katie is our head of upper grades and both have years of experience working at the, at the school and will be ready to field any, any questions as well as I might be able to. So let's see how are the logistics gonna work here, Lisa. You'll, you'll present and should I just, you'll just get a sense of when I've talked through a particular slide and move us forward. Okay. How's the view for everybody? Can you, can you see the, and you're a couple slides into the presentation now, Lisa, but can, can everybody see the, um, the text adequately? Is it big enough? Okay, and we also are happy to send this to you um, as, a, as a link. So as I was mentioning, here we are to talk a bit more about the proficiency-based graduation and grading and reporting system. It's been a few years now since the Agency of Education asks schools to adopt this system. And so we'll talk through for those who may be new to this presentation, some of the, um, some of the mandates that we're responding to, but, but pretty quickly, we'll just get into what it looks like at Randolph Union. And um, one thing that's new this year is the Agency of Education has pr is prompting schools to reflect on our progress so far and have asked a few questions and shared some resources. And so we've done that reflection with our, our teacher leadership team recently. And so we'll share some of the thoughts that they have about where we, the state of this reform here at Randolph Union, where we're consistent with what the agency has been asking of us and where we still have um, some, some places to grow. So by way of overview, let's see, and that's a very small slide for me, Lisa, so I'm just gonna go back to my, um, some, some of the major takeaways for this evening are, in, in our opinion and the opinion of our teacher leadership, this, this system is a, a better and more detailed way to look at student achievement than um, traditional reporting. And by traditional reporting, I'm referring to what um, probably most of us knew when we were in middle school and in high school. Um, and, I'll, and I'll talk a little bit more about the differences as we go along. But overall, we feel like it's a, a better, more detailed way to look at student achievement. Uh, overall, Randolph Union is, is well in compliance with Vermont Act 77 and meeting the Agency of Education's expectations in, in key areas. Teachers and students use this information in a variety of ways to understand the student as a learner. And competitive colleges, colleges of all different um, types are accepting our students and understand our new transcripts. Our transcripts have been using a different a way to communicate out um, achievement in this proficiency-based system for a few years now. And, um, um, and it seems to be working just fine when it comes to post-secondary acceptance to colleges. The next slide is, um, is, uh, is, is, is actually a quote from a group that's called the Mastery, um, the Mastery Standards Consortium, and it's a nationwide consortium, mostly made up of private schools and mostly made up of elite private schools, middle schools and high schools, that are themselves engaged in some pretty substantial reforms um, to rethink what it means to measure student progress over time. And, uh, and w one of the reasons why they're doing this is that they're, they're, they're noticing uh, extraordinary grade inflation, extraordinary anxiety in their young people as they, as they, strive, to, as they strive to achieve. Um, for instance, they, they, they stated a few years ago that over half of, uh, of all grades given in high school in the United States were A's. And that's a sign that this bell curve notion that we've had of, of achievement is simply not working the way it, it was supposed to. Um, and so we mentioned that to say that the state of Vermont is in, is in good company when it comes to lots of thoughtful schools whose students are achieving at the highest levels and getting into some of the most competitive colleges. The state of Vermont's public schools are in good company with other schools that are thinking this stuff through. And Randolph Union is a member of this mastery consortium. We won't go into detail here, but for your reference and for the reference of our students, our new teachers who come into our school, our families, and for others, we have a proficiency-based graduation handbook that details, um, that details our system um, with a lot of specificity. So that's on our, on our website and the, the handbook portion of things for people to have a look at. And the next slide takes us into um, proficiency-based, um, a, a, a screenshot of a, of a proficiency-based report card um, from last year, it's an it's an English class, and you can see that there's writing. There are there there are, there are a few things listed there: writing, presentation, reading, discussion, language, and then habits of work and habits of heart. And um, 
I don't, I don't know about all of you, but when I was in high school at Harvard or when I went away to, to college, I would typically get a letter grade at the end of a semester, at the end of a quarter. And so I might have been in my English class and earned, say, a, a B or B minus. And um, that tells me something. It tells me I certainly have, I'm good at some things and I have work to do at others, but it doesn't give me um, the kind of specificity that, that this kind of a report card does. Because I might walk home with a B on my report card and again, know that I've got work to do in some areas, but I don't know exactly what areas those are from, from the report card or from the, from the, the rubrics that the teachers have, are, are, are giving me. I don't know if I'm good at writing but struggling at reading. I don't know if I'm good at discussion but struggling with, with grammar. I don't know if my, you know, my being punctual to class is affecting my grade or if my frequency of participation is affecting my grade. All of, that, all of that kind of mystery that surrounded the grades in the old system um, is, is clarified a bit with a proficiency-based system where you get an additional level of detail. And the challenge that comes with that, and one of the questions that Lane asks us to continually reflect on, and it's a very good one, is in our efforts to provide more information, are we providing too much information? And what is the right amount of information? And what is the right amount of work to ask of teachers in terms of the number of grades and the number of assessments that we're being asked to do at this level of specificity? So while we think it's, it's good that there's an additional level of detail in the proficiency-based system so that the child can understand him or herself as a learner, we still have some ongoing work to do to make sure that we're com communicating the right amount of information so that's actionable and it's, it's efficient for teachers and they don't spend all of their time grading and, and no time planning lessons. There's, there's a balance that we're still seeking to strike as we, as we continue with this work. This is a, a screenshot of the proficiency-based gradebook. We chose a gradebook that has the, the misnomer of being called teacher ease. It's not that easy for teachers, um, but uh, that's the system we chose uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that it allows you to look at an assignment and see what the grade was, the holistic grade for an assignment in terms of its standards. And it also allows you to look at the standards themselves and see how kids are doing um, in, 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 that, in that view. So that's a look at what teacher ease um, looks like in the online gradebook. So we'll, we'll want to talk for a minute about how students are, are, are helped to use this information, how families are using this information, how teachers are using this information, and how our guidance counselors are using it. This is a picture of a student at a 10th grade portfolio defense, and we do this at, at eighth grade as well. And then there's similar kinds of presentations that we ask students to do all throughout the year, including student-led conferences. Um, you have a student here who's standing up and talking about his skills, his, his proficiencies and standards in his different subject areas. And he's talking to his present teachers, his past teachers, and to some of his future teachers. And he's talking about his goals for the future in light of how he's doing in his proficiencies. And the next slide shows just an example from, from the notes of a 10th grader last year or the year before who was, who, who was writing down what she was gonna be saying to her panel. And you'll notice here that the child is using some, it's like, it's kind of teacherly language. The child is using the language of the standards and the performance indicators and the rubrics to talk about herself as, uh, as a writer. So it's that kind of knowing yourself as a writer, as a student, as a scientist, as a historian, as an artist, that we're going for with this kind of a system. The student says, I was really able to get my writing organization down across the board this year. And I think it's because I was finally able to conquer making a claim. And a clear claim is easier to back up with evidence. Then do the reasoning or the conclusion making, making it completely more organized. So she's talking about, again, her own writing with some of the terminology that comes from the standards-based report card or the proficiency-based grading and assessment system. And that's what we like to see as a student who's more and more knowledgeable and articulate about herself in each of her subject areas. Families use this information in various ways. One way is just to ask us for more specific information. For instance, we will get emails from, from families where they're saying, well, I see my, 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 my son or daughter is getting a, a partial proficient in this area. Can you say more about why they're getting a partial proficiency in this area? Or 
What are the opportunities for exceeding proficiency in this class or on this assignment? Um, parents are using that kind of language to talk with us about, about proficiency in different standards and performance indicators. Teacher teams are using it at a variety of, of levels, of course, with the individualized student or with groups of students. And teachers also pool their knowledge uh, together to decide where they need to craft interventions. So this is a snapshot of a ninth grade team's spreadsheet where they're, the green are the students who are on track to complete the course. That means they're, they're at or near proficiency in the standards for that grade level. And then the red is the, some students who are not on track. You'll also see down there in, in the science column, the teacher is projecting that some students are on track to earn honors in the course or high honors because students can achieve in any course at that level of, of attainment at the, end of the, at the end of the course. Counselors like Bev and Kara in the Student Services Office, they're, they're looking at student achievement data through the, at, at the course completion level. And so this is an example at the middle of the year how for students who are applying early decision to colleges, how we give those colleges a sense of how the students are doing in their courses. So the course completion track, this student is on track to complete a course with high honors, another course with high honors, and one course with honors. So that information is given to the colleges with some teacher comments, and that's the same information that lives on the student's transcript later in the year. And the good news is that colleges uh, have no trouble deciphering these transcripts. Um, they're used to transcripts from all over the world at all, all different shapes and sizes, and Ours comes along with uh, a school profile that explains exactly what we mean by complete with honors or, um, or, or just complete. And our students are getting into a range of colleges as they, as they always have from private competitive schools like, um, like Middlebury to UVM, UVM School of Business, Vermont State Colleges, and lots of other um, state universities across the, the country. This is a sample of some that students have gotten into this year and last year around the mid-year mark um, when we're typically asking Bev and Kala, Bev and Kara for this, for this information. So um, in terms of this, this spring, and again, we asked our teacher leadership to think about our system and where are we in alignment with what the AOE is asking us to do and where are we, um, where are we different or not, or not yet there. So the, the next slide is about where we find some consistencies. The Agency of Education expects that every student knows what's expected of them and that there are clear targets for success. And our graduation standards and performance indicators are very specific. And we're continuing to simplify so that there are, so that there are fewer and, and, and it, as clear as language as possible. And where we have redundancy that we don't need, we're trying to eliminate that redundancy. So um, that's something I mentioned earlier, trying to find the right balance of, uh, of how much specificity to actually give, but we certainly have clear targets for success. We report separately on habits of work and academic skills. So we wanna make sure that a student understands that their punctuality to class, their organization, their ability to submit something in on time is important and we wanna give them feedback on that habit of work. But we don't want the students to get confused with doing well in that area and also mastering um, how to model in mathematics or mastering some content in social studies. The this, this proficiency-based system pulls those things apart so that students can understand their skill sets in different areas. That's something we've been doing for years. And the AOE also asks that we have a local comprehensive assessment system and where you have Track My Progress in the elementary schools, we have STAR 360 at the, at the upper grades that, that complements along with SBAC, um, the standards-based assessment that's happening in the classroom um, for math and English and, and in other areas. We're also finding some consistency in terms of students being able to work at different levels. Our student work is evaluated on a continuum from partially proficient to exceeding proficiency and students can achieve at honors or high honors in each class. And also we report out on the proficiency level rather than a percentile average. So I'll just pause to say a bit about that. Again, when we were in high school, Many of us probably got a, you know, a quarter one report card in, in October, and it had a great like a 79 or an 85 or a 92 on it. And then in quarter two, we got another number grade. Maybe it was an, an 86. And then we got another one, which was maybe a 95. And over the course of the year, those percents are averaged to be one um, grade at the end of the year. 
Now, what the proficiency-based system tries to, to do differently is instead of locking in that first quarter grade, let's say I'm struggling with the new expectations of ninth grade and my first quarter I'm I'm, I'm really struggling and I get a, you know, I get, I get a lower grade. Let's say I get a 77. Well, in the old system, even if I was getting a 95 at the end of the year, that 77 from when I was just starting out would pull my average down into a B. And the B may not actually be an accurate reflection of where I've ended up at the end of the year. So we, we report out on proficiency levels and those proficiency levels typically grow over time. And the more recent grades, the grades at quarter three, the grades at quarter four are the ones that count more in the proficiency-based system because we wanna honor that student growth happens over time and we don't lock in where they are at the start and average that in with where they are at the finish because it's actually not a fair representation of where they've ended up. Somewhere, some places where we're not yet congruent with what the AOE is asking, and where we still have room to grow and where I would suspect most schools have room to grow, especially with this one, is the idea that time is the variable. What the agency of ed means by that is, um, is that students are allowed to learn at their own pace. And that's all well and, and good and important. And we try to do that as much as we can within a still very time bound system. We still talk in general terms and have the general assumption that graduation from high school will happen in four years. We're not talking about students graduating in eight or nine years and some graduating in two. We're not at, yet at that level of time is the variable kind of um, perspective. Schools are very regimented in terms of our calendars, our schedules, our semesters, our year-long calendars. And so um, it's, that's something we still need to work hard to pull off. And even Lane, you know, your, your allusion to the, the working groups will have to, to develop in order to have some, some summer or other sessions where kids can, 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 can continue to work on proficiency. That's, that's an effort to make the school less time bound, to help those students learn at the pace that they need to learn at. But it takes some really special initiatives from the state level sometimes to make that kind of thing happen. The AOE asserts that students should have a proactive role in designing their own education and we value that very much at our school, whether it's at the level of the individual project or the courses that students are taking. But at the level of course selection, students have a lot more flexibility in grades 11 and 12 than they do in the lower years where there are some required course sequences that students need to march through. And we're not giving students a whole lot of choice necessarily whether they go from ninth grade science into 10th grade science. There are certainly exceptions sometimes, but Students have a more proactive role in designing their whole program of education as they get older. And then the other thing I, that we, we thought we should note in terms of um, where our teachers feel like we need to do more work of establishing consistency is that our clarity about what, uh, what students need to, to know and be able to do also needs to translate to real clarity about what it means to achieve at, at honors level and high honors level and that across, across departments we need to seek more consistency there. So that's something that we want to we want to continue to work on um, from our teachers perspective. And they're right. We want to we want to make sure that we have more and more consistency with what it means to achieve at different levels in the in the courses. We think that in the COVID era, we have a, a proof of the concept to a certain degree. Um, as you all know, learning was significantly significantly interrupted in the spring. But what our proficiency based system did with all the information that our teachers are generating is it allowed the the spring teachers to communicate to the fall teachers with a good deal of precision about what the students either didn't get to, what learning targets we didn't have a chance to cover, or where they were achieving and where they still need some focus. So that kind of conversation was happening from, say, your, your, your ninth grade social studies teacher to your 10th grade social studies teacher, so that there could be that passing on of knowledge from teacher to teacher with some specificity, which proves some of the value of this sort of a system. And then also the COVID era with our, 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 our more limited instructional time with students and the interruptions that are just um, par for the course, it prompted us to simplify more and to reduce where we could the number of standards and performance indicators that we're, that we're asking um, students to, um, to be accountable for. That doesn't mean necessarily 
um, watering down the curriculum. It means simplifying what we're asking of, of the students. And again, like I said at the top, if there's a redundancy that we can get away, uh, that we can do away with, we'll do away with it for the sake of simplicity and clarity and, and transparency. In conclusion, just to recap some of the points made at the top, and then it'll be wonderful to have questions for, for me or, and Katie and Lisa. Uh, we, we think the system is a, is a better and more detailed way to look at student achievement, but there's more norming and more consistency needed, and we need to keep working on that. Randolph Union is, is, is in compliance and meeting the AOE's expectations in, in key areas, and we have room to grow in others. Students and teachers are using the information to understand the student learner, and there's a continuing need to, to simplify that so that so that there's additional clarity. And uh, in terms of post-secondary readiness, competitive colleges are accepting our students and they understand these proficiency-based transcripts. And we think that's worth mention at the top and now because it was a it was a substantial concern for a lot of families when Vermont first began this reform, how colleges would perceive it. So we we just re-emphasize at the top that. Uh, it hasn't seemed to be a barrier in terms of communicating with college admissions about what courses students have taken and how they've done in those courses, which above all is what colleges want to know. And we can convert GPA as it's needed. And so we ha had no issues in terms of communicating with the college admissions officers. And we know that's been a concern from our community. So um, that's the slide deck at this point, I think, um, Lisa and um, and Lane, we can open it up to whatever whatever questions or comments um, we'd like to field. Yeah, uh, board board questions first. So I'll jump in. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Hawks and Ms. Sutton and Ms. Floyd. Um, last year, I really enjoyed being a, a part of the senior project. And I'm just curious, is that, I know last year it had to be put on hold, is that something that we were able to um, institute again this year? And then my follow-up would also be with the portfolio defenses, which I do believe that that ability to um, effectively speak to peers and teachers is a, is a great skill for kids. So are those um, programs, are they in place for this year or are they on hold? Katie, why don't you talk to about senior project and Lisa, you could answer the, the portfolio defense question where we're at with figuring out uh, what the end of the year will look like this year. Sure. Um, thank you for that question, Ashley. It's, it's, um, we've, we definitely wrestled with senior project and how we would handle it this year, knowing the surmountable barriers with, you know, communicating and working with community members during a pandemic and how we were going to treat that. Um, we are, um, senior project is in in full force. Um, we began the year modifying timelines and deadlines and thinking about how we would best accommodate students throughout the process. Um, throughout the year, we've run into obstacles that have led us to find alternative pathways to students for students in senior project. Um, one constant that we know has remained and and will remain is that every senior will write their senior project research paper. Um, and then the other components of the project we have, it, it has been custom. We've really needed to accommodate the seniors and the really significant obstacles they're facing this year. Um, so a maj the majority of them began by um, engaging in the project as written um, with modifications here and there, meaning that they they went through the project or planned to go through the project, completing all of the components. Um, but then as the year progressed and we realized that many of them were really struggling with these components as a result of many of those external barriers that have come with the pandemic, um, a lot of them have opted for different pathways. So now, um, there are some who are still engaged in all of the components of the project and will finish it as it has been written in previous years. Uh, there are others who just have extended deadlines on the paper, um, but are finishing all of the other components of the project. And then there are those students who are writing the research paper um, to fulfill their, their senior project graduation requirements. So we've really needed to be flexible this year. It's been a challenge and we are trying to balance out the uh, barriers and challenges and trauma our students are facing with you know, the importance of 
the project itself and what we've heard from alums and community members about the important components of the project that really lead the students towards success in their post-secondary lives. So it's been a little bit of a balance this year to figure out how those accommodations will both support students, but also challenge them and hold our standards and expectations high. Um, so currently we're in a model where they are, um, they're able to choose from three different pathways um, as explained earlier, um, and it's been successful so far. So we're just gonna continue to support them in whatever ways they need and, and hold the ground of every senior writes the senior research um, project paper. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the portfolio defenses, which normally happen at the eighth and 10th grade levels, um, there are a couple of barriers to doing that the traditional way. Number one, um, students would build their portfolios in their advisory. And this year, because advisory is a multi-year structure at our school, we haven't been able to have advisory the way that we traditionally would. So you might have a seventh grade teacher with a 10th grade advisory. And because we're not crossing cohorts, um, that hasn't happened. So instead, we're running morning meetings, which are sort of taking the place of advisory. But we didn't want to call it advisory and have it be something that it really wasn't. So that structure for portfolio defenses isn't in place. However, um, we've been discussing these at our leadership team meetings with teacher leaders from grade level teams, from departments, and thinking about the most important components. And really, we think it boils down to a couple of different things. Students being able to take stock of what they know, um, knowing themselves as a learner and being to reflect on the areas where they struggle and where they need to grow. And then additionally, being able to communicate that um, to their teachers and to people who they you know, want to present their best work to or this self-reflection. So it's a combination of things um, and we're still working out the details of how that will happen. But grade level seat teams seem to be interested in taking on the challenges of pushing that reflection and ensuring that that happens. Thank you. Other board questions? Hi, can, can you hear me? I switched computers. Um, I have a question about the report card report and the committee. Is there a committee that works on the report card and assesses the effectiveness of it? And since the big switch a few years ago, like has that been an ongoing process since then? And is it still ongoing? Or is it like, okay, this is this is the end and this is our report card and this is it? That's a good question, um, Chelsea. Thank you. It's our our leadership team serves that function, which includes our department chairs. So they so the head of the English department, math department, science, social studies, that that group, plus our grade team leaders is the is that committee. And so that's the group that's been saying we need to try to to simplify what we're what we're asking and do we have do we have the right number of standards and performance indicators um, and so each year there's an assessment of, of that but we don't have a separate committee which is something we could we could consider because create you know moving it outside of that teacher leadership group could in, invite more participation from more stakeholders so that may be a suggestion we want to note tonight if, if that's a suggestion inherent in your question um, so we don't have a, a separate committee for that but we have a leadership team that's continually trying to make those that report card and the and the teacher and the online gradebook um, a better tool. Is it modeled after another report card somewhere out in the world, or is it just like an internal Randolph and sort of thought process? Yeah, it's um, it's it's modeled after work that's been done across New England for several years. And there's an organization called the Great Schools Partnership and the Agency of Education leans pretty heavily on their resources. If, if one goes to the Agency of Ed's page, there's a lot of links to the Great Schools Partnership documents. So there've been schools in, in New Hampshire and Maine and other places that have been wrestling with this reform for longer than Vermont has. And so we were able to learn from them about the pros and the cons of what, um, what a standards-based report card ought to look like. 
And then there are a lot of a lot of vendors out there who have the online grade book, the standards based report card, whether it's those those big corporate powerhouses like PowerSchool or more mom and pop things like this organization called Jump Rope that certain Vermont schools are using. So there's a lot of there's a lot of this work happening um, on the, both on the tech side as well as on the school side. So we've been able to borrow best practice from from all over the place um, as we put this together. But in the end, each school district was responsible for basically figuring it out on their own. And so I would say it's a little bit of both. Okay, thank you. <laughs> other, other questions from board? I, I just was um, wondering, it sounds like the teachers have been fairly heavily involved in giving feedback and in tweaking this system. Um, seeing as they're the ones who are using it and and i know and i i'm actually really glad to hear you talking about you know trying to figure out the balance of how much information do students and parents really need to know and how much because that involves a lot of significant time and energy for teachers to be inputting all of this very specific data about where a child is on on very specific skills and concepts when a lot of times parents want to know and i i noticed um that you've made it a little bit clearer in terms of you know writing presentation uh, I, I forget what the other there was just four it wasn't like 500 i and and that must be one as a as a parent in the system speaking from that hat that's a little refreshing because before it was just like so much information it was almost overwhelming and maybe and i just kept thinking i i don't need this level of information i'm glad the teacher knows it but i don't need that level of information the, the basic level was good enough but i would imagine for the teachers it might also be helpful to know that level of of information but at the same time you've got to balance that out so it, it sounds like you're getting feedback from teachers and teachers are helping to continue to make the system work for both them and the families that they're interacting with and with the students yeah, really I think, question. It's just a statement, I guess. I think it's important for teachers to have had the time to work on it and then reflect and then simplify and see what really works well for them. I think as important as the teachers understanding where our students at, one of the things I really love about this system is that our students know where they're at. So for example, for years we've taught writers who are great at establishing purpose, supporting a claim with evidence, making really beautiful paragraphs, but their punctuation and grammar might be lacking. And when you average a grade and they're still getting a 93, the incentive to actually work on those specific areas is, is not as great as it is now when we have students who don't want a BP or a PP in a single performance indicator. So I think that communication between student and teacher is so important. And this grading system really allows us to give that information. I, the only thing I would add is, is and in a way, I'm, I'm like as, as overwhelming as that information was, it was kind of nice to roll it out like that so that at least the community could see the kind of like, what the teachers really see more of the back end of it and like all of the detail that actually goes into that like MP in writing is broken down, you know, into so much when you actually look at teacheries and, and dig in. Um, but yes, it's so nice to now have it more simplified so that you can just look at it and be like, okay, writing MP. Now I'll go to the teacheries end and dig into that if I really wanna look at some of those performance indicators. Um, and I think it's also allowed our teachers to really be thoughtful about what it looks like to pare down. <laughs> what do students really need to know? What do parents really need to know about how their students are doing? What is essential and what isn't is a part of, I think, our ongoing, <laughs> you know, wrestling with this. 
So good. Um, questions uh, from anybody out there in the community? Chris, you got your hand up, go for it. Hi, um, it's Chris Armstrong. Um, I have a son who's going into the high school next year. So, um, so I, going over the whole um, standards-based report cards, I definitely see, Elijah, I appreciate you pointing out all the ways that it's helpful because I'm initially going into it, I was not a big supporter of it for a lot of the reasons that you mentioned. And so I definitely see how it's helpful for that information. And um, the thing that I still struggle with is I wonder, um, talking about what what information parents need i know that that before when like when i went through high school it was a lot easier for my own parents to push me into a certain track i wasn't necessarily the person who um wanted to to take the cp courses or wanted to do those things but um for them i think it was easier that they could ensure that i was in that course and then they just had to kind of keep track of this how i was doing in that course now finding myself with my own son i I feel like um, it's not clear what he needs to do to get that CP credit or to be on that track. It's like, okay, so do a little bit more, go ask your teacher what it is. And I feel as a parent, it's really hard for me to help push him to what I know that he's capable of that he might not want to do at that time. Um, so so just feedback on that, that is that is something that I'm finding to be a struggle. Um, same thing when it comes to grades and when it comes to transcripts, um, I think it's great that colleges are accepting the transcripts, but then it's also hard for the parent to really be pointed uh, towards their own children and, and try to help support them in what they need to be competitive to the colleges that they might want to attend if, if we don't know what the colleges are seeing. So we're getting the, the report card as standard base, but we're not necessarily seeing what the colleges might see. And so, um, and I get that there may, maybe that's something that we can figure out and, and there's rubrics and we can kind of piece it together. But in this effort to not give too much information, but, but also have meaningful and tons of information, I think that I as a parent have lost the ability to really nail down what does he need to do to make sure that when that, that college transcript, and not just colleges, but also, and that kind of goes into a second question of, how about scholarships? Are, are we finding that the kids are still competitive with scholarships so that because, and I, and I get that it's changing, the system nationwide is changing and it's becoming more, more obvious that more systems are doing this and they're, and they're adopting the system. So it's becoming easier as we go along. But during this whole transition periods where some schools are not doing this and some schools are, um, are, are are we gonna have this phase where the kids currently in the school system, as we try to figure this out, might suffer in some of those ways where parents aren't, don't have the information they need to push them along that way. Um, and you know, like you mentioned that that you don't really do, you know, it used to be that you could go into 10th grade science as a ninth grader if if you, you were capable of kind of doing that. You mentioned that you don't really do that now and it's the same kind of with math. Um, but how are our kids competitive against kids that are still in a school system where they do that and where by the time they get to to be seniors they're taking courses that are by their nature more more complex and harder and they're getting the same grades but but when the college goes to weigh the two they see that well this, this kid took calculus and this kid took 12th grade math do you, do you, do you see what i'm saying so so i feel like i get it i understand i, I I appreciate that there are some great things about it. Those were things that as a parent, I'm starting to notice and have concerns about. And, and I wanna really be able to, to be clear when I talk to him and not have to sift through all that information myself and try and figure out how the colleges are gonna view it, how the scholarships are gonna view it. Um, yeah. really and good. so some, some more guidance. Uh, you will start to get a, a transcript once once your your son is in in ninth grade. I think even at the end of eighth grade, we create transcripts so that we you know can keep track. So you will start to see the format that colleges would see um, fairly soon. Um, and I'll just take a stab at a couple of your other. I was trying to take note of your three or four. Yeah, things. sorry, I, I was I was listening to your whole presentation, taking notes, and I was like, I got to save it all at the end. It's going to come out as a jumble. Well, so I thought it was clear. Yeah, I'll, just say a, I'll say a few words, and I'm sure Lisa and Katie would like to jump in. Um, I think you know. In general, uh, you to, if you want to 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 turn something from the words on the page into a GPA, um, and you want that GPA to be as high as it can be, you want a child to be achieving high honors. 
And so the question needs to continually be for the, for the teachers of the course, what is needed to achieve at high honors in this course, or what is needed to, to exceed proficiency in these performance indicators? And if you don't get an adequate answer to that question, an administrator should be told because we, we expect our teachers to have those opportunities in every course. But it does actually make it, I think, more reliant upon the, the, the student, maybe in partnership with the family, certainly in partnership with the teacher, to tap into that motivation to achieve at that level. Because the system that you and I knew when like, I got plopped into that college prep track at Harwood, at the start of the year, I was earning honors before I did anything, right? I was in that class. So I was an honors student in September. This system doesn't allow that. This system is an earned honors progression where you're in the course and you got to earn your honors along the way by doing the best possible work you can do. So that's one way of maybe reframing it as like, playing a lot of reliance on a student to earn honors by the end of the course, not earn it just by getting into it. And I think there's some value in that in terms of, in terms of you know, everyone's work ethic and also in terms of our need to really m connect to students' desire to achieve strongly. So that's one way that this system does flip the tracked way of earning honors. Um, I mean, yes, you earn it by your past performance and get into the next level, of course, but this place and places an ongoing need for the student to, 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 to do his or her best work all along, all along the way. Um, now, when it comes to what, you know, what wide array of, of um, AP and other courses a student at Randolph Union can achieve by the end of their tenure with us, um, that may be something Katie wants to elaborate on. There certainly are a lot of ways that we try to meet every student and family where they're at with their skill set and their needs so that if they want to be in Calc BC by the time they're graduating and also have taken AP Physics and also AP World History and all of the other offerings that we that we have, we're a small enough school that we have to alternate some of those, you know, AP Physics alternates with AP Environmental Science. So we need to be really strategic starting in like ninth and 10th grade to make sure that we get the sequence of things right. Um, but you can have a, a, a pretty impressive transcript by the time you graduate from, from, from RU if we're really strategic um, from early on. And I wanna, do want to think it's important conversations and a great conversation and a lot of good questions, but we do want to be cognizant of time um, a little bit um, here. Um, so if there's a quick follow-up for another minute or two, um, Katie or Lisa, if you had anything, I think it would be you know good to respond, uh, but we will need to move on pretty quickly. Yeah, the last... The last thought I would add is that, you know, I, I also think we are very lucky to benefit from like the best in the business as far as our school counselors are concerned. Um, and that that council is so helpful and important too. And they're really involved with students in thinking through their pathways through our course offerings so that they are on that competitive track if they really want to be. Um, and we also have, you know, sprinkled throughout the school, of course, we have our um, department chairs, too, who are actively working with their departments to think through those pathways. So, like, how do you how do you lead up to AP computer science if that's what you're going to do? And how do we create that pathway? How do you get to AP Calc, AB and BC? How do you get to AP you know, bio, how do you get to AP environmental science or AP lit and language and how do you balance all of that out? Um, like Elijah mentioned, it's important to have those conversations early, but at the same time, you know, we're at the ready to help to guide students through that process from the second they, they walk into the, the door and I'll, I'll let Lisa expand. Yeah, I think another important part of this process, along with the school counselor, is the advisor. That's the person who's meeting with the student every day um, for the first four years that they're at Randolph Union. Um, and so when I had an advisory, I knew what programming my students were interested in, what their dreams were, what their goals were. And so I could connect them with Kara and essentially be a liaison between the student and student services so that Student services, you know, we have two people who serve our student population in terms of school counseling, and that's great. It's actually good numbers compared to like state and national averages, um, but it's harder for them to know specifically what students need. Um, so we have that structure in place. And also, um, typically on the syllabi that come out at the beginning of, of, of the school year, 
um, the teacher will outline what a student needs to do to earn high honors um, in their class or honors in their class. So that's a good place to take a look right at the beginning of the year. And if you don't see it, reach out and follow up. And so I, I want to thank the three of you for spending some time with us tonight for a very detailed presentation, um, standards-based report cards. And I've got to say, because I think it's important to give the credit um, where credit's due, I'm not a fan of standards-based report cards, but I am a fan of the work that has been done at the high school because it is probably one of the best systems right now that I have seen in terms of, of work towards that end. Um, the tremendous amount of work and the Herculean effort that these folks put into along with the staff to create what currently exists um, was massive, was intense, and they've done a damn good job. Um, and so they, they, they deserve an awful lot of credit for that work. Um, I also have to say that there is significant value um, in the work that was done as the teachers go through and look at the standards and what the expectations are for students and have those discussions, because uh, it really brings to the forefront um, what they're engaged in every day with the kids. So I do want to thank um, our, our three folks here tonight, and uh, I do want to thank the faculty and for all the, the really good work that's been done towards this end um, at the high school. So thank you. Thank you. Um, the next uh, piece here is uh, the quarter, quarterly facilities report. Um, I'll talk very briefly about this, just so folks who have not seen this before um, kind of understand what this is. Um, this report actually serves uh, a couple of purposes. Um, it's kind of our basis for kind of a strategic vision of all the work that we are trying to do around the, the district. Um, and why I say that is because it's got the numbers down the left-hand side that, that represent the priority. You know, what's our biggest priority to get done in the next year versus the next two to three years versus uh, four to five years out. Um, one of the purposes um, in terms of presenting this to the board is for oversight. Um, it shows uh, in the first couple of columns the work that has been done, the cost um, of that work. Um, and then more importantly for the oversight piece is I actually go out or Robin goes out our business manager and we do direct inspections. And so when you see our initials in there, it means that we've actually gone out and looked to see that this work was actually done and the money was spent where it was supposed to be spent. Um, a couple of things about this report, there are three items there that are in orange um, to kind of talk about because there'll be things that are on the board's agenda um, in the coming months. Um, the first uh, I want to talk about is the central office. Um, we've spent a significant amount of time um, in kind of fixing things that needed to be fixed in and around the district for the last two or three years. And most of that work is now done. Now we're kind of moving into this phase of enhancing. Um, one of the last pieces though, um, in terms of, of, of fixing, what needs to be fixed around the district is central office. Um, it's an older building. Um, the windows are starting to rot um, around the casings. Um, it is also the main storage unit for the district's records. Um, and we've been having some difficulty downstairs um, with maintaining you know, the humidity and the temperature and, and the quality that, that's needed for those records. And so uh, Wes and Bob are taking a look with some contractors and trying to see what we can do in terms of revamping um, and putting the renovations into this building that we need. And we purposely waited until the more important work in and around the schools that supports the students was done. Um, so that is, uh, that, that is something that you're gonna see um, probably with a request uh, to tap into the facilities reserve fund to pay for some of that work. Um, one of the other last pieces on the, the fix it side of things is the Brookfield um, water. Um, they've had water issues for years. Um, we tried some less expensive fixes over the last couple of years. They didn't get us where we needed to go. They did improve things, but not anywhere ne near where we need to be. Um, so we have uh, approval from the state um, to begin the process for drilling a new well. Um, and so we've got that work that's going on and that'll be a request um, 
relatively soon uh, to the board to tap into reserve funds to pay for that work. Um, one of the smaller requests, and again, this is, is fix-it work, is the athletic fields. This is something that we talked about probably about two years ago. And the athletic fields, um, you know, there's a safety factor that's involved if the fields aren't properly maintained. Um, what ends up happening is the soil gets compacted. You have a harder surface for the kids to fall on. If it's not the proper grass that's growing, um, it doesn't provide the cushion as well that's kind of necessary um, for kind of the rough and tumble sports that we have out there. And we were looking back and, and there has been no real maintenance um, or dramatic work that has been done on those fields to keep them in the condition um, that, that they should be. So one of the things that we're going to be asking for as well, um, again, is uh, about $30,000 um, for the first year of a three-year program to renovate those fields in terms of getting the aeration they needed, in terms of the overseeding to get the proper grass growing that, that, that should be there. Um, and also, um, you know, fertilization, irrigation isn't such a big deal in Vermont as it is in some other states, but it'll be about 30,000 in the first year. Um, second year, it'll be cut in about half. It'll be about 15,000. Third year, it'll be about half of that again. And then we will probably um, be able to get by with a, a couple of thousand dollars a year of doing the proper maintenance. And again, a part of the reason for looking at this is these are um, things that um, just all three of these things are things that, that, that should have been done a while ago um, and still need need to be done um, to get us through that fix it phase, as I'm calling it. So are there, are there questions from the board on any parts or pieces of the, uh, the facilities report or any of these projects? All right, then the next piece here um, is to move forward uh, into board management and governance. Um, I think it's important uh, to introduce, introduce uh, Chelsea Sprague, um, our new uh, board member um, representing Brookfield, um, who's here for a first time and did a good job getting connected in with, uh, with the internet and being able to join the meeting. So I welcome her. And then our next um, piece on the agenda is uh, the reorganization of the board. Um, every year in March after um, the town vote, um, the board uh, decides again, you know, who, who will serve in various officer positions. Um, and the first one is for the chair of the board, which is currently open. Um, Laura uh, was the chair for uh, the last couple of years and was also on the board for, for, for 16 years. Um, and she is going to be having some relaxing times um, moving forward. And so I'll open it up to the board um, for nominations for chair for the board for this year. Thanks, Lane. Um, I would like to nominate Ann Kaplan to be the chair of the board. I'll second. So there is a initial and a second. Are there other nominations? Hearing none, um, discussion. Ann, are you willing? Yes, I'm willing. Um, I, I am not a great timekeeper, so I may ha sort of delegate that task to have to have some help just keeping track of the time. Um, but yes, other than that, and I take it if it's not working out, I can always say, you know what, I, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> Somebody else can try it. <laughs> So other, other discussion? All right, we'll close discussion and I will ask the board um, to vote. All those in favor, um, actually if, ra use the raise your hand button. And that way Linda can get the names. So, uh, Linda, we've got Katja is, is a yes. Uh, Rachel is a yes. Ashley is a yes. Hannah is a yes. Megan is a yes. Ann, Brian, and Chelsea. So it looks like it's unanimous. So congratulations, Ann, and I will turn uh, the meeting over to you. Okay. 
So the next um, board position open is the vice chair, and that was Rachel Gates. Um, and Rachel, are you interested in remaining in that position? Or do we do we have to have nominations for? A, okay, so we're gonna have a uh, anybody want to nominate someone to be the vice chair? I'd like to nominate Rachel to continue in that role if she is willing. Rachel, are you willing? I'm willing, but I'd like to nominate Katya. <laughs> I'm going to make it interesting. Katya, <laughs> are you willing to uh, be vice chair? Um, sure, I'm willing. I'll Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> so do we have some some discussion or do people have anything they want to say in regard to these two nominations? Or do the two nominees have anything they want to say? So I'll say that um, that being the vice chair to Laura was a pretty no, it was not a very demanding thing because she handled so much herself. Um, so what I did was basically go to the agenda planning meetings. Um, I think there's probably opportunity to do more um, and maybe support the chair more. And, um, and Katya, if you are interested and have the energy for it, I'd be glad to hand it over to you. I, I don't mind the position, but again, um, I probably haven't made it, uh, probably haven't um, maximized the position, I guess, so. I can say as a chair, Katya, <laughs> and not having been a chair before and having, um, being more of a team player, I'm going to want someone who's going to help me out um, as the leader of the board to make sure that we are doing what we need to do to lead the board forward. So I may delegate some tasks to you, or at least I'll be working with you and, and looking for advice from you. So there might be a little more to do. Um, yeah, and I appreciate the nomination, Rachel. Um, you know, I definitely am looking for opportunities to increase my involvement in the board. Um, I wasn't really ready to tackle the idea of chair this time. So um, I definitely welcome the opportunity for vice chair to be able to just learn more about the ins and outs and be a little bit more involved um, and, you know, support the chair in this role as well. So. So is there any more discussion before we vote on these two nominees? I think we need a second. Oh, we need a second for both nominations? To, to I don't know how that works. <laughs> yeah, to, to have a vote, um, you would need a second um, to vote on a specific uh, person. I'll, I'll second for Katja if Rachel is willing to give up her spot. I withdraw that nomination. <laughs> I appreciate it. And I'd have been glad to stay in the position, but Katja is perfectly capable. And maybe maybe we'll balance Anne a little bit better. Anne and I, I think, um, sit on the same side of some of the issues and, and Katja um, walks the middle line a little better. So, so she may balance Anne out. A little. Right. So are we ready um, to vote? All right. So all those in favor of Katya as the vice chair, uh, you can raise your hand. And let's see if I can read these off. So yes for Chelsea Sprague, yes for Ashley Lincoln. Yes for Hannah Arias, Arias, 
uh, yes for Megan Salt, yes for Brian Baker, and yes for Rachel Gates. Did I miss anybody? Okay, so the eyes have it. So now, um, and I don't have the list of, oh, there, we, there it is, right there in the agenda. So the next, next up is the clerk. Um, and it's currently uh, Ashley Lincoln. Ashley, would you like to continue on as clerk? I would say that if somebody else on the board would like to do it, um, since I am uh, part of RTCC, um, I'd be happy to have somebody else take that on. And I am local, so that's, I think, one of the reasons why it worked out well for me, but happy to have somebody else do it. Ashley, can you tell us a little bit about what you do as the clerk? Um, I try to get Linda information on time. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a few emails. Uh, so I am the one who, um, you know, during executive session, I uh, draft what is, spoke, uh, you know, the, the votes. And then um, post-executive session, when we go back into a regular meeting, um, because Linda has often um, left, I will finish out those, um, the documentation of that for her. And uh, if Anne was not available to sign a document, I would be the one who would go and sign documents. Um, right now, I do get, often I get um, the warrants that have all of the checking account um, information that has to be signed by a board member. So I sign those directly for Brenda. Um, so that we don't have to delay and wait on accounts payable uh, for each meeting. Do we have any nominees for the clerk? Is anyone willing? I'd be glad to nominate anybody who's willing. I work out of town, so. And often I, I'll, I'll, I'm willing and I'm right in town. Thank you, Hannah. I nominate Hannah. What? Clerk. <laughs> okay. And do we have any discussion? Any, any more questions about what you were saying you would like to do? Hannah? No? Did we have a second? I yeah. seconded that, Linda. Any discussion? Are we ready to vote? Okay, all those in favor of Hannah Arias being the clerk for the board. All in favor say aye. And it looks like it's unanimous. All are in favor. Okay. And then, um, so Ashley, you had said you were the one, before we used to assign the member to sign the official documents in absence of the chair. But Hannah, are you willing to go ahead and take on that as part of your duties as the clerk? Certainly. Okay. So we're going to do that. So then next up is to um, approve the schedule for regular meetings that was in our packet. Do we have to vote on that? The regular on, on the meeting, on the regular meeting? Uh, typically, because it becomes a part of your minutes, um, so you're stating for the community, you know, when you're meeting, and you guys have always done it second Monday, um, just so they know. Yeah. So Does it have I to be a Monday? And you guys can change it too. Uh, do you have a preference, Rachel? Um, just Mondays just seem like um, they just seem like busy days, anyway, and then. 
a couple times a year. The Monday that we meet ends up being a holiday, like in November, um, sometimes in October. Um, I don't know. I'm not, it's not, don't change it just for me. <laughs> it's working okay so far. The I ran for re-election, so, but just, I don't know. Is there a reason that it's always been a Monday? I don't know. Do you know, Anne? It's always, it's been a Monday since I've been on the board. And I so, think it's, and it's always been at 630 or has it always been yeah. at 630? Yes, it's always been at 630. Um, because we talked at one point about having it earlier. Um, and I would vote for that. Um, I would definitely vote for an earlier meeting. Um, I think that these make for, unfortunately, I feel like our agenda planning um, has not really stuck to the timeline that's presented to us, which I think is something that as a board, we should be doing better with um, as we are all, you know, working professionals. So I would advocate that we look at an earlier start time, um, whether it be a Monday or a different day, and that we try to be better about sticking to the um, allotted time that we have shared, not only amongst ourselves, but with the public. Mm -hmm. So do we have a proposal for, um, I, I'm hearing a possible proposal for a new time. Do we have a proposal for a, a new day? Um, Lane, this involves you a fair amount. Do you have uh, feelings in regard to? Yeah, um, in terms of uh, days, um, to be honest, Monday is a tough day. Um, not only that, it also, it's a lot of the holidays are Monday holidays. And so we're often in board meetings on Monday holidays and the pre-board meetings have always been on Mondays. So they're on, on holidays as well. Um, in terms of the school district, uh, probably the best day, um, not that the board can necessarily accommodate this, is probably a Thursday. Um, that's the typical um, date for most, uh, for, for, for most districts that I've encountered anyways, usually a Thursday evening. Um, you don't have the problems here that uh, we had in Boston where it took time for people to get through the two hours of traffic to drive the two miles home. Um, so, you know, they used to have their board meetings at 7.30, 8 o'clock. Um, you guys could probably easily get away with a 5.30. Um, that's when the high school typically runs its open forums. And those seem to be pretty successful. People seem to be able to have access to those. Anybody else have ideas about time and, and day? Always opinionated here. Go ahead. Um, 530 would be a stretch for me because I work out of town, but I can, I can attend by phone um, as I have before. So uh, six o'clock would be my preference. And I've, I'm fine with whatever day of the week. Thursday would be fine. Monday's fine. Okay. Shall we, um, do we want to, does someone want to move make a motion for a new a new day and time or a new time only well, i'll make a motion that we move to the second thursday of the month at 6 p.m i'll second I'm sorry katja it broke oh. out so sorry. what did you say what thursday the first i said the second thursday okay, of the month at you. six and we had a second from hannah is that right yeah Okay, uh, any discussion on this? Are you Are starting we... next month or when? I don't, I don't think they'd be able to start necessarily until July 1st. Um, would probably because you've already a, a accepted, um, and, I mean, you could change it, but you have already accepted the year calendar. Um, right last last year when you voted but you could change it going forward um it might be good if you do that to wait at least a month just so people can readjust in the community wait uh lane when you say the year calendar meaning when we reorganized last year we we accepted the the meeting dates 
the meeting dates and then the topics of the meetings. Okay. Right. You guys usually at the beginning of the, the school year, you have uh, kind of planned out what basic agenda is for each meeting, dates and times, and that's a public document. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The, so the annual agenda. Yeah. What you're referring so, to, not just the list of the meeting dates. Yeah. So you, you could change it, but I wouldn't like do it next month if you did. Right. Yeah. So that would mean starting uh, July 1st. So, um, Katja, you went away from your video, but do you want to amend your your motion to say that we would start this by July 1st? Sure. Sorry, I got kicked out of where, the room I was in. Um, oh. <laughs> yes, starting July 1st. So, motion to move to the second Thursday of every month, starting July 1st at 6 p.m. July 1st. Reseconded. Reseconded by Hannah. Do we have more discussion? Thank you, Lane, for uh, pointing out that we might need to push that start date back. Any other discussion on, on this motion? Are we ready to bring it to a vote? So all those in favor of uh, moving our board, mem board meetings to Thursday, the, the second Thursday of the month, starting on July 1st, 2021, um, please raise your hand. And I will see how I do watching everybody raise their hand. And that is a unanimous yes vote. Is that okay if I just tell you that, Linda, and then you can just. I take yeah, it just say uh, yes, or if it didn't pass or, you know, to or against or whatever. Um, okay. While I have you, I think you need to vote on the official signing of documents. That is not really the clerk's duty. Um, Okay. Really, the clerk's duty is to do the executive session, and if for some reason I wasn't here to take minutes, that clerk would need to take the minutes, okay? okay. But the site signature is a totally separate thing. I think okay. you need to make that official. Okay. So, uh, that person was uh, Ashley. Ashley, do you want to continue to do that since you were doing that? Um, and Or do you want to... So I'm happy to keep on doing that. I think that Brenda and I have a good, you know, back and forth um, and it's easy. So I'm happy to make that work. Do we have anyone else interested in being that person? Okay. Um, so any discussion on having Ashley do that? Okay, all those in favor of having Ashley be the person to sign uh, the documents in the absence of the chair, please raise your hand. And the ayes have it, it's unanimous. Um, I didn't, I need a person to mo make oh. the motion and second it. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so can we have somebody please make a motion? I'll make the motion that, um... Ashley is the signer in, in place of the. Uh, Do we have a second? I'll second it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Second it. Then I have to ask for discussion. Have any discussion? Uh, okay, we ready to vote. Uh, all those in favor of having Ashley be the person to sign documents in the absence of the chair, please raise your hand. And that is a unanimous for Ashley. Okay. Uh, and now we have, um, we need to appoint the representative to the RTCC board. Uh, Ashley, you're currently in that role. Um, would you like to continue in that role?
Yes, I do enjoy that. Do we have any other board members interested in being in that role or any nominations for other people? Or can we have a nomination? I have to ask for a nomination, correct? I'll nominate uh, Ashley as the RTCC uh, member. Okay. I'll and second. Megan Salt will second. Do we have discussion? Any other nominations? No discussion. Are we ready to call the question? All those in favor of having Ashley be the representative to the RTCC board, please raise your hand. And again, the ayes have it. So Ashley will be the rep for the RTCC board. Uh, then we need to have, we need to appoint the teacher contract negotiating committee. Currently, that's Brian Baker, Hannah Reyes, and Megan Salt. Um, do you all want to remain on that negotiating committee? We are currently in the middle of negotiations, so we might want to continue that for continuity's sake. Okay, I'm seeing thumbs up for that. Anyone dying to be on the teacher negotiation committee? Um, again, I'm going to ask points of, of Robert's rules because I'm, I'm going to need help with this. Uh, do I have to then ask for them? A nomination. Nominated? Nomination to remain for the same folks to remain. Okay. So do we um, have a nomination I'm, for the three to remain on the negotiating committee? I make a nomination that the teacher negotiating committee remains as it is with Brian Baker, Hannah Arias, and Megan Salt. Do I have a second? I'll second. Katya seconds. Do we have any discussion? Seeing no discussion. Um, all those in favor of keeping the negotiating team with the same three board members, please raise your hand. And it is again, yes, for a unanimous vote. Uh, next up, we have um, the appointing of the support staff contract negotiating committee. That's currently Ashley Lincoln, uh, myself, and Katya Evans. Um, is there restrictions to me being on one of these negotiating if I'm the board chair? No. Nope. Yeah. Okay. For continuity's sake, do we want to keep those that negotiating committee the same for right now? What do people think? I move that the current um, three are, remain the same for the negotiations for staff, support staff. We have a second. A second. Get that, Linda. Ashley, Ashley Lincoln seconded. So do we have any discussion? I have a question just for new board members that might, um, like Chelsea is new. Can she participate as an observer just to kind of see what goes on in those meetings if she's so interested or is yeah. that? The, yeah, those meetings are open to the public um, the way that we've agreed with the union. Um, she wouldn't be like, you know, in, in the old days before COVID, when we were actually all together in the same room, she wouldn't be sitting at the table with us uh, because that's kind of announced to, uh, to the other side. But she certainly can participate, be a part of the meetings. Um, yeah. Um, the other thing that we can do is I believe, if I remember the ground rules, um, if she decides that she does want to be a part, I just have to give the union a heads up that, hey, we're going to have a fourth have a fourth person. Um, and they, as long as they agree, she, she would be okay uh, to be there and actually participate. Okay, thank you. So are we uh, ready to, uh, to vote on the support staff committee? negotiating committee and we have again a unanimous 
vote for yes, Linda. Okay, and then next up we have um, to just have a check-in re regarding the, the negotiations with the unions and yeah. uh, risk presentation from Elaine. And that's for 20 minutes, but we're, we're moving pretty slowly, although we, yeah, we have about 20 more minutes worth of stuff to do. So we can... Maybe. Yeah, I'll try to move. I'll try to move it. Um, in terms of that, and again with the negotiations kind of update, it's just uh, basically what folks are asking for, where we sit, and where the the, the when the next meeting is occurring. Um, we'll start off with the support staff. Um, we met um, on the fourth of this month. Um, the things that they are seeking um, right now in these early stages of the negotiations, they're looking for an hour a week of paid prep time. Um, an increase in tuition reimbursement uh, to the current UVM three credit course cost. Um, they are requesting that on days, uh, again, their hourly staff, they're requesting that on days that we have snow days that they get paid for those days. Um, they would like monthly air quality surveys done in all classrooms and all buildings. Um, in terms of salary, uh, they are asking for a 19% increase over the next two years. And the next meeting uh, with uh, the support staff is on April 1st. So questions at all on uh, support staff? Teacher negotiations, um, we last met on February 16th. Um, they are asking for a retirement buyout uh, for about four people a year um, based on our estimates. Um, that's about 97000 per person that they're asking for um, for the retirement buyout. Um, they are seeking to increase the number of sick leave days they can use to take care of uh, sick family members. Right? They are allowed to use some of their sick leave if they have somebody who is sick at home. Um, asking for that into, to increase from the current 30 days to 60 days. Um, they are also seeking to increase the number of paid uh, family medical leave uh, days from 30 to 60. Um, they are looking for an hour of self-directed planning time each day. Um, they also would like monthly air quality monitoring in all rooms and all buildings. And they are seeking a 13% increase over the next two years. Uh, their next meeting is March 16th. And I don't know if there's questions on either support staff or on teacher's contract. Do we have any questions for Lane? And then in terms of uh, kind of this, the RIF discussion, I'm going to give me a moment to pull this up. Uh, the reason that I kind of had this discussion is because there were some changes that were agreed to uh, with the union about uh, which staff were included in the CBA and which staff were not. And one of the impacts of the inclusion of uh, those staff members was the fact um, that uh, the staff that are grant funded are rift every year until the money from the grants is assured. And I just wanted to kind of explain this to folks so that they understood that there's a, a reason behind this um, in terms of uh, budget and kind of what uh, executive limitations compel me um, to do and how to respond. So give me a second to pull this up. This will be about five minutes. Now, I can't see you, but can you see the presentation? Yes, we can. So um, reduction in force, also called RIFs, um, uh, layman's terms outside of education, you can think of them as layoffs. And typically in education, there, there are three occasions where they're used. Um, if uh, student enrollments decrease, right, that's been a, a trend around Vermont. Um, is that uh, as people have moved out of Vermont, um, there's been fewer and fewer students in schools. And so in a case like that, you end up with more teachers um, than are needed to educate those students. And some of those students may be laid off, they may be rift. Um, another situation is when there is a, a, a decrease in the budget. So say that we went out, um, presented our budget to the town, um, 
it covered exactly what we needed um, for our costs and the town voted it down. And we ended up having to make dramatic cuts to that budget um, to be able to get that vote to pass. We might have to lay off teachers because we wouldn't have enough money to be able to pay for, for all the staff. Um, the one that's highlighted here is the one that we're going to talk about, um, just so that people understand where these yearly rifts come from. And it's this idea is that when contractual obligations require the district to offer the staff their contracts before the money to pay for those positions is assured. So in other words, um, in the case of these rifts, uh, the contract requires us to actually give teachers their next year contract by April 15th. But the problem is, is we've got a number of staff that are funded by grants and we typically do not hear back from um, the grant agencies, uh, typically the federal government, on whether or not we are actually going to receive the money to pay those staff until mid to late June. And so, when a staff member receives a contract and they've signed it and the board has approved it, that contract is guaranteed and we are obligated to fulfill all the terms of the contract that we've signed into with them. So as of April 15th, regardless of whether that position exists, if we give them a contract, regardless of whether the grant money comes through, we are still obligated um, to pay them um, for the full amount of that contract. And so, how this relates to these, these rifts that happen yearly, um, actually the executive limitation that we're gonna talk about um, very shortly, there are two pieces of this that control my actions, um, right? The biggest one here is the superintendent shall not cause or allow the development of financial jeopardy, right? So we've got $500,000 worth of staff that are funded by grants. If I don't riff um, these personnel um, prior to April 15th, um, the district could be in a pretty severe state of financial jeopardy because we are still going to owe that 500000 and not have any way to pay for it if the grants don't come through. Um, the other piece that is also uh, a part of Executive Limitations 2.1 is that the superintendent shall not expend more funds than have been received. So if I offer these contracts to the staff, um, I am in effect locking in the spending of money um, that we do not have yet, that is not yet assured. Um, and so I just think it's important for people to recognize um, that the rifts are not intended to actually cut the positions. Um, they are to make sure that I am in compliance with uh, the, the policies that are laid down on me. Um, and that uh, in 99% of the cases, you know, that grant funding comes through. You know, it's not 100%, it's 99%. But if uh, you know we did not do those rifts and we gave uh, out contracts, um, we would be in a state of, of financial jeopardy, not knowing if that money was going to come in. And this has been even more important to consider, given that we're in the time of COVID, um, and uh, the economy is not what it used to be. Um, the last thing I'll say before I close this out is this idea that the timing of the rifts is dictated by the contract. Um, I know last year. We had a couple of folks that were a little upset on um, the fact that they got the RIF notifications just before April vacation. Um, that was strictly due um, to the timing in the contract. We had applied for the grants. Um, we were hoping that we were going to hear uh, that the grant funding had come in before April 15th so that we didn't have to put out the RIF notices. But of course, uh, you know, April 15th came. Um, we had to put out the RIF notices because that's what the contract requires. Um, and uh, because the grant money hadn't come through. So, you know, there people were a little upset. Hey, we got this just before April. And I got to say this, it, it had to do with the fact that we were trying to do the right thing. We were trying to hold out as long as we could to see if the grant money came through and was assured so that we didn't have to send out the letters at all. Um, but the board should expect that we will talk about this at the next um, uh, meeting um, because those risks for those grant funded um, employees, you know, will, will be due because of this process. So that's it for the, the RIF presentation, unless there's, there's questions from the board. So Lane, you said this was because um, we changed the the change in the in the contract. So they added these positions into the contract. 
But yeah, so they were in the board, not the board, excuse me, the union actually made a very good argument at the time, and, and I agreed with them. Um, prior to, to me starting, what was done with these folks was um, they were given special contracts. And basically, there was some small wording in the bottom of the contract that said, you know, these, these positions are grant funded, you know, implying that if the funding didn't come through, you know, we could cancel your contract. And because they're on a special contract and not included, um, that means they don't get the benefit of the teacher's master agreement. So they were outside of the teacher's master agreement which meant that the district could cut them at any time if the grant funding didn't come through. Now, the, the union came in and made the argument that, hey, you know, a lot of these grant funded folks are working directly with kids and are licensed by the AOEs. So by the AOE, so because of that, they should be a part of the, the collective bargaining agreement. They should be a, a part of the union. And they were right um, based upon that argument. But the piece that happened is that when we made that inclusion, right we ended up in this kind of catch-22 or okay you in, you're in you've got the cba protections but it means that i have to riff you every year because i don't know if i have the money until after i have to give you your contracts um and that's going to put the district in in a state of financial um liability so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense a lot of words in a in a, in a quick amount of time um and so yeah that is that's a yearly thing we had one year where the grants actually um were approved prior to the April 15th date in a couple of cases, and we didn't have to put out RIFs that year. Um, but that's very rare. Typically, we don't um, receive you know final approval until till mid uh, to late June at best. Okay. Any other questions for Lane about the RIFs? Okay. So uh, the monitoring reports we have. Uh, the EL report 2.3 and 2.6. And I believe we're on uh, those we have seen already. So we need to um, vote to accept those. Um, do I have a motion to accept EL report 2.3? Or do people have any questions about 2.3 before we make a motion to accept it? I make a motion that we accept um, both EL reports 2.3 and 2.6. Do we have I'll a second? second? Megan is going to second. Any discussion about the reports? Seeing no discussion, are we ready to uh, accept the motion to, or vote to, yeah, vote to accept the motion to accept the EL reports 2.3 and 2.6. And we have a unanimous vote except for Chelsea, unless you haven't met. <laughs> oh, we have a unanimous vote. <laughs> so the motion passes. Uh, next up, Lane, you are going to speak a little bit about uh, what's going on in the, in the legislature. Yeah, and I'll keep that that brief because I know we're running a little bit behind. Um, just so because uh, we've got a couple of newer folks on the board, on those executive limitations reports, there is evidence. You know, you think about them like a research paper where there's evidence in there that documents that. Um, in some cases, you can encapsulate the evidence within the reports um, themselves. In some cases, the, the evidence is on the outside. Those reports, after you receive the first one, the evidence is always sitting in a binder here in central office. So if there is ever any question that the board has about um, the statements in there, um, it's always a good idea. You can always come in. This is part of the oversight duty. Um, ask for Linda to see those those binders and, and take a look and look in them um, to make sure that everything is there that, that folks may need. Um, in terms of the uh, advocacy part, in terms of what's happening in the legislature, um, I put a pretty detailed kind of presentation in the superintendent's written report on that because there was a lot of a lot of different pieces in motion um, in the state legislature that's directly um, geared towards education. So the only two that I'm going to talk about a little bit, um, because I think they're really important and they may have an impact either on our finances 
or on our actual structure in terms of the school day. And the first one is uh, Senate Bill 100, which is uh, for universal school meals. Um, if this ends up um, becoming law, it's actually a good idea, but again, it's kind of this unfunded mandate piece here. Um, is that they're seeking that um, all public schools provide free breakfast and lunch to all students um, at no charge, which is great. Um, but the problem is, is that the cost of this, and it's written directly in the bill this way, will be borne by the local school districts. Um, in our case, um, we will still, you know, should this go through, um, students that qualify for free and reduced lunch, if they fill out the paperwork, will still get um, reimbursed um, partially from the federal government for that. But the potential cost to the district is probably in the $300,000 range um, of, of new money that we would need to spend. And then the only other piece, unless there's questions on the other, other parts of legislation that were in the superintendent's written report, is the education recovery um, from COVID-19 that we kind of spoke about a little bit. Um, what's going on right now is the Senate Education Committee is hearing testimony um, regarding, you know, what it would take uh, across the state um, to stem any kind of educational losses that have happened for the, the students and the children here um, because of COVID. Um, so they've heard the testimony on it, um, but they have not taken any real action at this point in time. Um, but this has the potential um, of changing the structure of the school day or a school year for a while, because the only way to catch students up that have missed out is to provide them with more time. Um, so it's possible if grant funding comes through for this, if there's some funding for this, is that you know we would uh, potentially be running some summer schools and or um, extending the school day for, for students in need. So just to keep that in the backs of people's minds. I am actually hoping that they do come up with something for this one uh, because there will be um, shortcomings um, due to COVID that, that, that will need to be addressed. And unless there's questions on, on any parts and pieces of that or what was in the, the broader superintendent's report, um, those are the only pieces I'm gonna, gonna touch on. Okay, so next up we have um, the consent agenda uh, and that involves the uh, approving the minutes from the meeting on February 8th, uh, approving the minutes from the budget informational meeting on February 24th and the minutes from the annual meeting on March 1st and the administrative contracts, which um, Linda sent out a second email with an updated one that had a couple and I'll, of And I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask the board um, as part of the contract approval. Um, we also do have a teacher contract um, for our band teacher for next year for the high school um, to include in that. Um, but I do wanna introduce um, Heather Lawler, um, who is here. Um, you know, we're talking about the administrative contracts. Um, Heather is uh, Pat Miller's um, replacement. Um, Pat is, has decided to retire um, after many years of incredible service to the district. Um, Heather um, comes to us. She's got a bachelor's degree in English, two master's degree, one in ed leadership, one in ed technology. Um, she served in a number of administration, administrative positions um, in Windsor Central Supervisory Union, um, including principal of Reading Elementary and the associate principal of Woodstock Union High School and Middle School. Um, she is the top choice um, of the search committee um, in terms of the, their recommendation to me and me to the board. And um, they are incredibly enthusiastic um, about her willingness to take over um, Braintree Elementary. And I don't know if the board would want to invite her to speak, um, but she is here and she's an absolutely wonderful person. Ashley, you raised your hand? Or was that an accident? <laughs> 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 uh, does the board want to hear a few words from Heather? Yes, I'm seeing that the yes. So go ahead, please, Heather. And Heather, I apologize if I put you on the spot. Good evening, everyone. I say hello to you from my home. Uh, so please forgive the, the humble surroundings. Um, I'm so excited to join your team. I had the pleasure of serving on the Integrated Field uh, Review Committee 
So I was in your schools in January and February of, of, la of right before the COVID shutdown. And I got to meet, I got to meet so many of you and your, and your leadership team. And I was in Braintree. I actually got to be there, which was so exciting because as you may know, interviewing in this time, you can't go inside. So I got to see the children playing chess and I got to see the teachers really engaged with their students. And so when I saw the position posted, I was excited to apply and I'm so thrilled to be your top candidate and I hope you will approve me tonight. And if you have any questions, I could answer quickly, but basically, you know, I live here in Vermont. I'm dedicated to uh, being a school leader and I'm excited about join, joining uh, your team and getting to know more of you and learning more about um, what you want for your students and serving you as a leader. Great, thank you very much. Does, does anyone have a quick question or shall we keep moving forward? Okay, looks like we're ready to move on. So um, are we ready to um, have a motion to pass the the um, consent agenda as it is. Do you want us to do the minutes part separate from the contract think, documents or I think all we together? Can, the consent agenda, I think we can pass it as a whole. Yeah, I just know that sometimes we have, Lane has requested that we break things out of the consent agenda. Uh, this one should be should be fine. Um, the one thing that I would ask you to do, um, because it's not on the consent agenda right now, is to make a motion to add the approval of the, the teacher's contract to it. And then what you can do is then you can um, move to, to accept the consent agenda as a whole. Okay. So can we have a, a motion to add the the uh, band teacher contract to the contracts that we're approving. Can I just make just a, one more quick question to, to Lane, I guess. I know um, it's not really the, with policy governance, the board is um, it's really your decision on who to hire, but I just want to make sure that, you know, going with um, Lisa and Katie, that we are, there's no uh, procurement process that needs to be followed to um, kind of replace Elijah, you know, being that we're on tax money, just making sure we're, there isn't something that needs to be advertised or followed through. Uh, because they're currently existing in those positions, um, there really isn't much that's changing. They're already there. Um, the big thing that is changing is that Elijah's position at the high school is not being replaced. What we are using those resources for is we are shifting them over to RES. Um, and the reason that we're doing that is to provide uh, Erica with an assistant uh, principal over there. Um, and part of that is to help out after, uh, used to be they were under that co-principal model where you know Erica was at RES and the other two um, principals would spend a lot of time there and, and leave the smaller schools a little un unattended. When we shifted things to make sure that there was a principal always present at each of those schools and dedicated to those schools, um, she lost out on that support. So it makes sense to be able to shift the resources there to support that. And that person, um, again, through uh, the discussion process through the same um, hiring committee that that, that worked uh, with Heather um, to, 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 to gain Heather um, has the recommended uh, Melinda Robinson for that position. So again, they're already in those positions. Um, really, what's going on is um, is Elijah is is position is uh, those resources are being shifted over to RES. If that makes sense. Okay. Any other questions before we make a motion to add the band teacher contract to the to the contracts that we're approving in the consent agenda. I move that we add that band teachers contract to the list of contracts in the consent agenda. We have a second. Second. 
Seconded by Brian. So all of those in favor, please raise your hands. So the motion is passed unanimously to add the band teachers contract to the contracts in the consent agenda. Can we have a motion now to pass the consent agenda items? So moved. Second. Moved by Katya, seconded by Brian. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Again, that's unanimous. So the motion is passed. So next we're on to the uh, reports from the superintendent, principals, uh, financial report, and other incidental information, which we probably should talk about because that's planning the staff appreciation, which comes up really quickly. And I am trying to remember what we did last year on that. Uh, and it's going to be a little different this year, probably. So, yeah, so I can um, I can talk a little bit about that. I don't know if there's questions on, on the superintendent's report um, or not. Um, in terms of the financials, we're in very good shape. Um, we actually, Robin and I were comparing, you know, where we are this year um, to where we were last year at this time. And we're actually in a little bit better shape um, than we were last year. Um, the only thing that stood out to me on the financials um, was a, a bit of a deficit in terms of uh, uh, cafeteria, in terms of meals. Um, but uh, when I checked a little bit further, that was because um, they're about two months behind on updating the receipts, which they're working on. So we, we're actually in pretty good stead there. Um, in reality, under COVID, um, we are spending less money um, than we normally would um, in a lot of cases is what we're finding when we looked at, at the financials today. So we're in good shape there. Um, in terms of staff uh, appreciation, um, we were kind of in the same boat last year. Um, and what the um, board, just as a reminder, um, had done last year was uh, they went out and um, purchased uh, gift cards um, for the staff and purchase them from um, you know, local businesses to try to support the local community as part of the process. And so that's something that, you know, as you guys discuss what you'd like to do is, is a possibility. Yeah, last year it was Chef's Market. So any ideas on staff appreciation? Was it? Like, was it well received, the gift, gift cards? Everyone likes the Chef's Market. Yeah. Of course, I don't know. Is Chef's Market still in business right now? I yeah. thought, okay, um, there's one that changed, so, yeah. Yeah, Downtown Deli's not, but Chef's Market is. But the new sandwich shop that's in the deli place is right. delish, just tried today. Yeah. If we do yes. the same idea with supporting um, downtown um Businesses, is there a way to like share the love <laughs> with the downtown businesses? So we're not just, you know, we're either choosing, you know, I don't know how many we could choose from, but if either people get a choice of where they get it from or, you know, we have a certain amount from each so that that's a little bit more spread out among the businesses. Yeah. I think I think it would be easy enough to do. The board would have to decide, you know, which uh, which places would be on that. Um, kind of on that buffet, I guess, is the best word. <laughs> Would it be appropriate to, to ask if we had maybe a couple of volunteers that wanted to come up with a suggestion? How quickly do we need to turn this around? If it's, it's March now, and we have April, and then it's the week of May. So do we have a couple of people who want to take this on and maybe come up with an idea and how much did we spend? I'll volunteer <laughs> yeah so I do this for Gifford every year um, we give we have 18 locally owned businesses and we offer gift card gift certificates to each one of our employees during the holidays 
and there's a timeline when you have to use it within one month and we coordinate directly with the businesses how that is utilized so i'm happy to work with katja on that um and again i think the idea of choosing a few businesses to to spread that out um, as people all have different choices but keeping them to a locally owned, you know, not Shaw's, not Kinney's, you know, um, more of like the huggable mug, um, black crim, that kind of idea, I think would be really nice. And we could, um, as part of helping out with that, if it were helpful, if, if you have a, a context of which places are possible, um, we could also send out a survey to the staff about, you know, who goes where, if that's helpful to the, the discussion and the work. Um, would be easy enough to do. Okay, so will we, do we need to um, have a motion or to create a group, uh, a group it, of Ashley and Katya to, to put together uh, a proposal? If you're, if you're giving the, if you're giving them the authority to just make the decisions and run with it, you would um, nominate, make a motion. Um, if they are just coming up with ideas and coming back to the board with it, I would say you probably didn't need to. What, what's the um, rule of the, of the board? Do we want to have them just come up with ideas and bring it to the next meeting since that should give us enough time? That will be April and the staff appreciation week is may um ashley you've done this before will that give us enough turnaround time okay yes um so uh so is it the will of the board to just appoint ashley and katya to uh come up with a list of possible local places to provide staff with uh, a gift card to purchase items from there. And then the budget for that lane, is that coming from the school board budget? Is that coming from? I I believe um, you guys, it comes out of the line that you have, um, but I can double check with Robin. Um, last year, it was based upon what you typically spent for the the um, the kind of the brunch luncheon that you, you had for them in previous years. And so we can get those numbers. Actually, Linda, if you're willing um, to send those numbers to, to Ashley and Katya, um, that would be helpful so they know what they're working with. Um, and you also can decide if you want to increase it. Um, I can find out, you know, what remains in that uh, in that board line. Um, and we can always come up with more more elsewhere if needed, you know, within reason. And then I'm I'm just going to bring up one other thing that it's not on the agenda here. Um, but Laura Rochat served a long time on the board, and I'm just wondering if we want to add in maybe a, a you know letter or a card of appreciation, and maybe a gift card for her as well. Yeah, this, the board is on board with that. <laughs> this might be a bigger discussion because um, we've had a couple of board members. You know, we had Paul, we had Ann Howard, um, and Linda and I were actually talking about it um, as part of following up on, um, you know, recognizing staff that had made, you know, a certain number of years of service and things like that of, um, you know, creating plaques for them to send out, you know, as, as another possibility, but I'll leave it up to the board um, to decide. So we, we had, we had talked about that a little bit. Okay. Maybe that, maybe we can put that on, on an agenda for the next, next meeting. Okay. Katya, you got that written down? <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so next up we have the board evaluation and we didn't actually appoint a board evaluator. And can I, I have one other thing that's not on the agenda oh, and sure. sh shut me down if I'm not allowed to do this, but I'm just wondering about, um, Lane, that was so helpful <clears throat> that you sent out that email earlier about the vaccines <clears throat> and so, teachers and staff. I just wonder if there's a, I, I don't know, follow up or conclusion or anything like that. Yeah, actually that's a, that could go along with our kind of our incidentals. So, um, the, the state like a lot of states is moving to try to vaccinate teachers to make it more possible to get kids back into school um, full in person. Um, they reached out to us. They actually called us one morning and said, hey, you know, 
um, we, uh, it was like the day after the governor's address last Tuesday when they kind of announced this plan. And, and I give them a lot of credit because it, it sounded like they were kind of knew it was coming, but were also a little surprised by the announcement. So they were scrambling around trying to make things happen. We were originally set to get vaccinated on the 11th. Um, they called us up a couple of days later and said, no, we're moving you to the 19th. And so what has happened is they gave us some special codes for the staff to log in with um, this morning. Um, so the staff have been busy kind of signing up for, to go and get their first round of vaccinations on the 19th. The only problem is, is that, um, you know, they don't, they don't have enough space to do everybody in one round. Um, and so I'm sure all the slots have been used up now. Um, so those of us that were busy today will have to wait till the next round. But my guess is by the second round, whenever that may be, that you know all the staff who want it will have been um, vaccinated. Um, I believe we had 359 staff members that met their eligibility requirements. I, I sent that information over to them to plan. Um, to the union's uh, credit, um, they did reach out. Uh, I haven't had a chance to respond today to them, um, asking to kind of sit down and say, hey, you know, with the, as the warmer weather approaches, we know you've been talking about, you know, going back to five days uh, full in person. And now with the vaccines, it seems like it's much more reasonable. So they're reaching out to start having a discussion about what that would look like. Um, so I, you know, I think um, in terms of next steps, uh, for full in person, you know, it'd be nice to get all the kids back. Um, things will still be a little bit problematic at the high school level because of the additional spacing requirements. Um, so my guess is April vacation-ish. Um, one, we'll need time um, over the vacation for the facilities crews to move uh, things around for the new configurations that'll have to happen. And two, it should get us to a point where hopefully the weather's warm enough that we can kind of permanently schedule some classes outside under the tents. And that'll free up some more space in the building. Um, so between the vaccinations, um, warmer weather um, coming, you know, the hope is, is that, you know, before the end of the year, we've got everybody back if we can do it. Um, path isn't clear yet. Um, again, it's Vermont. Lord knows when it'll actually get warm. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, the hope is there. And it, it sounds like, um, you know, I appreciate the union reaching out. It sounds like the heart's in the right place to make this happen. So that code went out already to all eligible. Yeah, staff. that came out, um, came out today, um, probably around noonish. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so board evaluation, since we didn't have anybody appointed, we, we all recognize that we're, we're a little bit behind schedule. Um, and we had a lot of sort of reporting, so there wasn't a lot of discussion necessarily. Um, so I think I'm gonna pass through that. Um, and then do we have, um, something that we need to go into executive session regarding. It looks like we have a personnel issue. Okay, so um, do we now adjourn our official meeting? No, we have to keep this official meeting open and we're going to move to executive session to um, discuss a personal issue. Do we have to have a motion to move to executive session? Yes. Can I have a motion to move to uh, executive session to discuss a personnel issue? I move, I move that we move to executive session. Sorry. I'll second that for Brian. Do we have a link? Yes. Yeah, so yeah, give, me, give me a moment. I'm actually looking to see if there's a link. If not, I'll send one um, so that we move out. Here, I'm going to create one right now. Two seconds. Okay. So we had a second. Do we all? So did we vote to move into executive session? Can we uh, typically, you would. Yeah. Okay. So we're can uh, I see hands? And I'm seeing everyone. That's unanimous that we move into executive session at 8:54 p.m. And give me one more second, Megan, Rachel, Hannah, Chelsea's on here already. Wow, somebody updated the, that's awesome. All right, so your links should be hitting your inboxes, your OSSD inboxes right now. 
I move that we amend the minutes from our meeting on November the 9th, 2020, to reflect the outcome uh, of, oh man, I should be writing all of this down as I say, but to reflect the outcome of the vote um, at the very end of the meeting after executive session. Whew, does that cover it? Second. Do you want to add the date of that executive session? I know you found it. It was 11 9. Right. Okay. 11 9. Yeah. Just maybe add that to the mm -hmm. Got it. motion. Should we also add the outcome of that vote? That it was unanimous? That it was yeah. a unanimous. Probably. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be doing this all over again. <laughs> uh, And then did she, do we have to um, you mark the time too when we came out of executive session? I did, it was 9.39. Okay, perfect. I'm taking my clerk appointment very seriously. Excellent. <laughs> and do we have any, we have, uh, we have to move the other, we, we have to vote. vote that one first. Oh, oh, that's right. Sorry. So do we have the motion to um, add the vote to the minutes from the 11 9 executive, executive session. Um, it was seconded by Brian. Is there any discussion, further discussion on that? Are we ready to vote? All those in favor? Looks unanimous. So the eyes have it. The motion is passed. Do we have any other motions coming out of executive session or any of the other? I'm, I make the motion that we give Ann the authority to contact Pietro to start uh, negotiations with the superintendent on his contract. I second. Did you get favor? that, Hannah? Hannah? I got it, yes. Okay. So, and we're ready to vote, and it looks like it's a unanimous vote as well. Okay. okay. Woo. Um, and now I think we get to uh, look over the agenda items for next me meeting. Do we have to look at, do we have to do that now? No. no. Okay. I move Perfect. to adjourn. I second. <laughs> move to adjourn. <laughs> it's, it's, it's thank you very Ashley. much for the way. Yeah. And Lane, I, I can just call down to the central office to get the number for Pietro. Yep. Yeah, actually, if you want, I'll shoot, um, I'll shoot Lynn an email let her, let have her reach out to you with it. Okay. I may have it too. I can. I may be able to email it to you. Okay. All right. Brian, did you second that move to adjourn? Who seconded I that? Did. Ashley, I did. thank you. I, I'm. I made the motion. Oh no, not to adjourn. I made the. That's adjourn. gotcha. Glad thank you. you. I'm eager to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hungry for supper. <laughs> okay. So that's it. Yeah. Whew. See you next time. Nice work. Yeah.